Welcome to the social age. I want to take this chance to explore this new environment that we live in, to think about how it impacts on the ways we work, the ways we learn and the ways we play, and think about what we need to do to remain relevant in this new space. We can think about it as a change in our ecosystem. The pressures that bear on us have evolved. And as those things change, we need to adapt if we want to remain relevant, if we want to remain able to function well, able to be successful. But this change hasn't happened. It's happening and will continue to do so. One feature of the social age is that it's a time of constant change. And it's not just about technology. It's facilitated by technology, for sure, but it's much more than that. It's about the sociology behind it, the ways we think, the ways we connect. We see these broad swathes of change that have taken place. For example, think about our relationship with knowledge itself. Knowledge used to be something that we learnt. We took it from these concentrations of knowledge, from books, from universities. We put it in our heads, we learnt it, and then we did stuff with it. But today, it's less about what we know, more about our ability to find things out, to know where to turn to for information, to understand the validity of that information, and to be able to make sense of it and do something with it. Our ability to perform, and to perform differently today, differently tomorrow, to remain agile in how we do so. So our fundamental relationship with knowledge has changed. Sure, the technology may connect us to that knowledge, but it's our communities that will help us to make sense of it. So as we explore the social age, we need a map, something which will help us to understand where we are and where we're going. And luckily, I've brought one along, but of course it's not complete. It's a sketch map, because we're constantly discovering new aspects of this change. But let's take a tour through it and look at some of the key pillars, some of the key areas of change we've experienced, and think about what we need to do about them. Let's start with social collaborative technology. We're all aware of it. We all carry it around. Many people have not just a phone, but also an iPad, a tablet, a home computer, a work computer, multiple devices that connect us to multiple communities in different ways. Now, some of those communities are entirely social, the ones that we use for planning our birthday party, for planning sports activities. But some of them are highly formal, the ones that we use to find a job the ones that we use to be successful within a job. We're connected by the technology through to communities. And crucially, the technology is democratised. Think back to the old days of the organisation, where it spent huge amounts of money to install servers in big air-conditioned rooms, and it gave you a laptop and a computer, and expected you to be grateful for it. That's because infrastructure was complex. It was hard to put in place, it was expensive to manage, it was difficult. And so because the organisation provided infrastructure, we were grateful for it and everything that it gave us. But of course now, the technology is democratised. The infrastructure is distributed and freely available. If I want to send a video to you, there's not just one formal channel I can do it through. There are many channels, most of them informal. It's easy for us to share stuff. In that space, the organisation adds less value by providing the actual mechanism of distribution. And indeed, it actively detracts from the conversations we have when we use formal technology. Because one thing we know for sure is that people have different conversations in different spaces. So people who have a work phone and a personal phone use different words when they speak on those two devices. They have different types of conversations because we fundamentally understand that one is owned by the organisation and the other is owned by us. And whilst the organisation can seek to control what we do, can give us permissions and defined spaces that we're allowed to operate, on the personal technology, we create those permissions for ourselves. And indeed, we strongly resent any intrusion into those spaces. So social technology is owned by us and gives us a type of freedom to connect. Formal technology is owned by the organisation. And the takeaway is this. By controlling the formal technology, you can never facilitate the types of conversations and interactions that we require to be truly effective in the social age. So organisations that start by thinking they can procure a solution to social collaboration by buying and implementing a space which they own are only going to get the conversations which they deserve, 
which are the ones that people think they want to hear, we have to truly relinquish some control of the technology and the space if we want people to truly engage as equal partners. Because the truth in the social age is co-written by individuals and organisations. Both have a voice. Social collaborative technology is connecting us around the world in different ways. We're no longer constrained by the distance by which we can throw that stone. Things like distance have eroded, but in their place have risen new barriers, barriers of culture and understanding. It's easy for me to talk to anybody anywhere in the world through one of many channels these days, but that doesn't guarantee that we'll have understanding. The collaborative technology brings us together, but our culture, our ethics, our morals, our sense of fairness may be what keeps us apart. So we shouldn't think that technology is the panacea to all our problems. It simply brings us together in new spaces where we need to work together to understand how we can build that kind of new social community. Let's think about creativity itself. In the social age, creativity has been democratised. As we know, every device of consumption is one which produces things. So this device, which I can use to read the paper, I can also use to publish my own paper. My voice has been liberated and freed up. It's free of control. As the publishers told us, once everybody can produce something, the market will fill with junk. And of course it did. But then our societies, uh, our communities came along and helped us make sense of it. The filtering mechanisms of the community are what make things like Wikipedia work so well. They're able to filter and sort and rewrite, rewrite and recreate into a meaningful narrative. So when creativity is democratised, we each have access to many voices. We can use the spoken word, but we can also create music, we can create videos, we can create art. And indeed, we can co-create each of those things. But not with any notion that what we create has permanence. In the social age, very often, the story is published and continues to evolve, continues to change. It's one of the fundamental differences that we see. In the old world, we were moving towards codified knowledge concentrated in one place. In the new world, it's an ever-changing and ever-expanding set of knowledge, constantly adapting to new ideas, new information, and new input. The technology connects us to that, but it's how we make sense of it that's important. Co-creation is an important notion. The idea of how we work together to write a story. It's not just my voice, it's my voice as one of many. We can use these notions of co-creation at different levels. We can use it within communities to help make sense of things and share that story. We can use it at an organisational level to help work with people in different spaces in the organisation to help them write the future state of that organisation. And crucially, if we allow people to be invested in writing that story, they can invest something of themselves in that future state. So by doing so, we move towards a co-created and co-owned model of change where people aren't told what to do, they're part of writing what needs to be done. The Agile organisation will always consider co-creation as a key tool it can use for engagement. Because if people's voice is heard, if they're not criticised or judged on what they say, if we create safe spaces for them to be part of that process, then they'll feel greater value and bring more of themselves into what they do at work. Consider amplification. Amplification is not about how loudly we can shout. It's about how magnetic our stories are, how able they are to spread. We see that many social media are formed on the foundation of amplification. It's the ability for me to tell a story which may be relevant, highly relevant to a small number of people, and to structure that story in such a way that it can spread easily. The mechanisms of amplification are vital because we can't rely on push models to get our story out there. Any organisation which starts at the top and tries to push change or to push a story down and out into its community will fail because it's like pushing your hand through mud. It just flows around your fingers. In a co-created model of storytelling, we tell that story and we retell that story. The amplification comes through the retelling of the story, the sharing over time. So organisations and us as individuals have to understand amplification because it's the very thing that often catches large organisations out. 
they approach it as something which they can catch and control, whilst in fact much of the amplification takes place in the communities that surround us. And let's think about brand. In the social age, brand itself has changed to be owned by those communities that surround us. Brand is no longer owned and controlled by a function that sits within your organisational walls, which creates a story and pushes it out. The brand is how you are perceived in the market. Your brand is the story that's written as a contract between you, the actions you take, and the ways they are received by consumers. And indeed, we are seeing people take hold of that. This is why we see the social authority and the social stories which are told out in that community, often fully subverting the formal stories which are told by the organisation. Your reputation will be judged by what you do, not what you say. We're seeing the rise of social leadership. And social leadership is authority which is contextual and consensual of your communities. It's an authority which is not bestowed by the organisation from on high. It's one which is given by the community because of the way that you have dealt with that community over time, the ways you have nurtured that community, the generosity and humility you've shown with your interactions. Sure, we can still build our social leadership capability, but we can never be granted it by the organisation. And what does this give us? Well, at a time when this ecosystem we exist in is changing, we'll see that formal authority starts to get less traction and social authority can fully subvert that formal authority. People who tell compelling stories with high authenticity will be better received than those who rely on their formal and positional power to try to force out organisational stories. The ones that try to push against the mud will fail, whilst the ones whose stories can take flight easily will succeed. We also see an increasing understanding and awareness of the need for greater social responsibility. It's no longer enough to think about our success in isolation. If our actions broaden the gap between those who are enfranchised by change, those who are able to take hold of these new mechanisms, these new technologies and communities and thrive, and those who for whatever reason are left behind, if the actions we take broaden that gap, then we're failing. As individuals and as businesses, we need to have a greater sense of social responsibility, that the actions we take have an impact within our community and we are part of that community. And this isn't just a nice to have. If we're not socially responsible, if we don't have true equality of opportunity within an organisation, we're not listening to all of the voices. And without all of the voices, our sense-making capability is compromised. So social responsibility isn't a nice thing to put on the website. It's something which has to be embedded in everything we do. As social leaders, we have a moral duty to ensure we have greater equality, greater equality of opportunity, greater diversity of opinion within the organisation, because that's the way that we'll hear the voices that need to be heard. The social age represents broad swathes of change, and that change is constant. Any organisation or individual who thinks they can react to that change more effectively is missing the point. We need to be adapted to surf on those waves of change. It's not something which is going to bother us because it's something which is constant. Indeed, we should view that change as the fuel of our own energy and agility. When the ecosystem changes around us, we have to adapt. Those that fail to adapt are the ones that go extinct. Our map of the social age just captures parts of this change. You'll see it says, here be dragons, which is what we used to write on maps in medieval times. It represented the fact that there are these areas we just do not understand yet. It's a continuous journey of exploration and sharing the stories of our discovery. So we draw these maps and we redraw them over time to reflect our evolving understanding. And that's the social age, the age that we live in today.